Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you a review of what is the third autofocusing full-frame 50 millimeter lens from Sigma in the last year alone. We have seen them release small, medium, and large, if you want to call it that options, in an F2, F1.4, and now F1.2 version. Though fortunately here, large is relative in that frankly, this lens isn't really any bigger than what the 50 millimeter F1.4 was. And that is a huge relief considering how huge Sigma's excellent but very large 35 millimeter F1.2 lens was. The first F1.2 lens on Sony E mount and I believe on Leica L mount as well. And of course this lens is released for both of those mounts as well. This lens really does give a pretty nice advantage to those platforms in that all of the first party 50 millimeter f1.2 lenses from Sony, Canon, and Nikon are all both larger and much, much more expensive than what this lens is, giving us a nice advantage on Sony E-mount or L-mount. You can get this lens for $1,399 US dollars, right under $1,400. So here on Sony, that is a good $600 cheaper than what the G Master f1.2 lens is. So, is this a lens outside of the excellent price? Is this a lens that you should consider if you're looking for a premium 50 millimeter f1.2 lens? Well, we're going to dive in together and find out right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by the Phantom Duffel, a new unique convertible duffel bag that starts as a compact packable case that easily fits into your luggage or carry-on bag, but then converts into a 35 liter duffel. The exterior is made of 1680D ballistic nylon, which is tough and weatherproof. The interior has a high visibility reflective finish that allows you to easily see what's inside, even in a dim hotel room. A large foam pouch on the side has a cable pass-through to allow for charging and the removable straps use a fid lock system to easily and securely connect them. I've been using it for the gym and it has room for my water bottle, a change of clothes, a basketball, my massive shoes, a towel, and a charger for my cell phone. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check it out and use code DUSTIN20 for 20% off when you're ready to check out. So as noted, this lens, fortunately, in size, is nothing like the 35mm f1.2. That lens was actually one of Sigma's first dedicated mirrorless designs on uh, Sony E-mount, for example, where I reviewed it years ago. And myself, like many others, really loved the performance of the lens, but found that the size just meant that there was more appealing options that were more compact. Sigma has avoided that particular pitfall here by making this lens really moderate in size. So it is 81 millimeters in diameter, so that is less than 3 millimeters wider than what the 50 millimeter f1.4 is, that's 3.2 inches. It also retains the same 72 millimeter front filter thread as what we saw on the, uh, the 50 millimeter f1.4 lens from Sigma. The lens is right under 111 millimeters in length or 4.4 inches, which ironically is actually one millimeter shorter than what the 50 millimeter F1.4 is. Now, because the glass elements inside are larger and heavier, the lens is a little bit heavier than the F1.4 version, but it weighs in at only 740 grams or 26 ounces. And so that is, it's less than 80 uh, grams heavier than what the F1.4 version is. And more importantly, when you compare to the Sony G Master, that is 40 grams less. And already the Sony G Master was easily the lightest of the competing lenses from Canon, the RF 50 millimeter F1.2, or the Nikon 50 millimeter F1.2 S lens. And in the case of the Nikon, that lens weighs almost 1100 grams. And so, much, much larger. It's 150 millimeters in length, so 40 millimeters longer, and of course, you know, close to 400 grams heavier. So obviously, we have a pretty significant advantage when it comes to the size and the weight of this lens. Now, despite being moderate in size, this is getting Sigma's very best when it comes to build quality. We have a thorough weather sealing that starts at the, the lens mount. There are internal seals. There is a special coating on the front element to help with fingerprints and moisture there. 
We also get their full feature set. So when it comes to the aperture ring, you have the ability to have uh, clicks in the aperture. You have the ability to declick the aperture. And so you can do smooth video aperture racking as you see in this shot here. You also have the ability to use their aperture lock which allows you to either lock this into only the manual focus ring and so you don't inadvertently go into the automatic mode. Or if you're not a manual focus ring or manual aperture ring, I should say, person at all, you can lock it into the automatic mode where you control it from within the camera, just like you would a, a lens without an aperture ring. So lots of controls there. We do have the AF-MF switch on the side along with a custom button or you know focus hold type button I will note in that case, that's the only place where this lens falls at all behind the G Master lenses in that they have uh, a dual focus hold buttons or custom buttons and so you can have them in multiple positions. But I mean, I think that most people can probably live without that additional button for $600. Inside, we actually have a really, really high aperture blade count. There are 13 uh, blades in this aperture iris, so that does a couple of things. First of all, as you can see, it retains a really circular shape, even stop down to about f5.6 here. You can see how circular that uh, aperture iris is. But then on top of that, it does make for a unique, if somewhat busy, 26 bladed uh, sun star. And so, uh, anyway, it's uh, obviously the goal here is more about retaining a circular shape so you have nice circular specular highlights, bokeh highlights uh, with the lens itself. Now the manual focus ring here is heavier damp than what the GM lenses is are, but I prefer that actually because there's more feel to it. It feels more like direct manual focus emulation than what I typically see on the G Master lenses that are a little bit light. Both of the 50 millimeter lenses are a little light for my taste, thus have a little less feel to them. So I actually prefer the slightly heavier damping here of the Sigma. It also comes, as is typical with Sigma lenses, it comes with the lens hood, which is a cut above. It's very sturdy, very nicely made, has some different texture variations on there, and it feels very, very substantial. It's plastic, but it's very high quality plastics. And it also comes with a padded nylon case for uh, portability. And so that is obviously very welcome as well. Also improved here is that you have a shorter minimum focus distance rather than 45 centimeters on the 50 millimeter f1.4. We can focus as closely as 40 centimeters here. That bumps up the maximum magnification from 0.15 up to 0.16. And for comparison, the 50 millimeter F1.2 G Master can get you as high as 0.17 times. So definitely within the same ballpark. Overall here, we have a really nicely executed package, very nice materials. It feels like a premium lens. It's got a premium feature set, but fortunately it is not massive. So that is a great formula, Sigma. Keep hitting that one. Now they've also thrown out all the stops when it comes to the autofocus performance here. So this is the first lens that I have seen where it doesn't, they haven't really marketed it, but when I dug into the specifications, I found that there's actually dual uh, HLA, which is their high, their high speed linear actuator or high response linear actuator. So it's high speed linear focus motor. So this is the first time that I've seen that they actually have two. There's two different focusing groups here. So there's one motor attached to each one of the focus groups. So that is increasing obviously the overall power needed for autofocus. Meaning that even with these large, uh, you know, elements that are glass elements that are part of an f1.2 lens, autofocus is super fast. Uh, it's near instant performance from you know close to infinity. So normal focus changes are definitely instantaneous. It's very smooth and quiet in operation. I have zero complaints on that front there. Uh, all as well. Also, I found that eye stickiness when it came to portrait work was uh, fantastic. I found that I was basically all of my focus results were, were perfect and I was shooting through different objects, um, you know, things in the foreground, different focus distances. Now, obviously at f1.2, your, your plane of field is going to be very, very narrow in many situations. So it's not unusual, for example, to have your, the eye that is focused on, if the, you know, if the subject's face is not flat, the eye that's focused on is going to be in focus while the other eye will be out of focus. That's a depth of field issue though. And what was, what's more important is that always autofocus, the focus results were accurate on the subject's eye. I also found in shooting, for example, shots of Nala that I was able to get the same kind of perfect focus on the actual iris, not on the eyelash or brow, but on the iris itself, just the place where you want focus to be. I also found on the 
uh, the video front that I was able to get smooth focus transitions and the focus pulls. They're quick, they're confident, there's no settling or pulsing hesitation, just does exactly what you want there. Likewise, good results with my hand test and, uh, and so that the transitions from the eye to the hand and vice versa were all nice and quick. And you'll also notice in these series of tests that focus breathing is nicely controlled. It's not extreme, a little bit less in fact than what we saw on the 50 millimeter F1.4. Now, the only thing I would say for Sony shooters that are looking for the absolute optimal autofocus performance is simply this. The uh, 50 millimeter F1.2 G Master, it actually has quad uh, XD linear focus motors. And more importantly, if you're using one of the sport bodies, it also has the ability to you know, focus up to 30 frames per second if you're shooting on an Alpha 1 or even higher on the new A9 Mark III, whereas we're going to be capped at 15 frames per second for the Sigma lens. For most people, that's really a non-issue, and frankly, I don't know how many people are using a 50 millimeter lens for sports use anyway, but if you happen to fall into that small niche where you need absolute performance, you wanna shoot 50 millimeter focal length, you wanna shoot sports, you wanna shoot really high speed bursts, the GM lens is going to still going to be a little bit better because it has even more focus power available to it. And more importantly, it is not artificially constrained by Sony in the way that the Sigma is. That's not Sigma's problem. That's a Sony thing, but it is important to put that out there. Outside of that, autofocus is perfect though. I don't think you're going to have any issues with it for either photo or video work. Now, let's take a look at the image quality side of things. And very interestingly, Sigma shared with me this, this graph that shows, if you look at the MTF charts from the 50 millimeter F1.2 and then the 50 millimeter F1.4, you'll see that the F1.2 lens is certainly capable of achieving uh, improved sharpness in both the center and the mid frame. Essentially, the rule of thirds is going to be sharper on the F1.2 lens with the F1.4 lens doing a little bit better in the corners, though it's by a very, very small margin. And so as I actually begin to examine that, and by the way, if you would prefer the detailed breakdown, stay tuned till the end and we'll do our detailed image quality breakdown at that point. But what I found is that there's actually better distortion and vignette control on the F1.2 lens versus the F1.4. The vignette thing actually surprised me when you consider that the diameter is not hardly any different and the front filter thread size is the same with the F1.4 and F1.2. You would think that the math would actually favor the F1.4 lens but in fact, I found that the F1.2 lens actually did a better job of controlling vignette in the corners. And also there is a, there's about half of the amount of distortion there. So definitely improved in those two metrics. I also found that in real world use, now in chart testing, both the F1.4 and the F1.2 lenses from Sigma, they chart really well when it comes to the control of like longitudinal chromatic aberrations, fringing before and after the plane of focus. But what I found is that in real world situations, I saw a little bit more fringing on the F1.4 than I expected, whereas the F1.2 lens behaved more similar to what I would expect in that those uh, aberrations are better controlled. So I'd say real, real world aberration control better on the F1.2 lens. I also found when I begin to actually break down image quality shooting on a 61 megapixel A7R Mark V and looking even at 200% magnification, I found that there is a really even, even sharpness profile all across the frame. Obviously the center is sharper than what the corner is, but the corner is still already at a very high level from early on. And so as I did kind of direct comparisons back across the major 50 millimeter players on Sony, I found that when it came, comes to the F1.2 G Master, I found that the Sigma is very slightly sharper in the center of the frame and the G Master is, is a little bit sharper in the corner of the frame. That is the same kind of scenario when it comes to the F1.4 Sigma lens in that this lens is definitely sharper in the center of the frame. Whereas I did find that, and of course mid frame also favors this as we saw from the MTF chart with the corners very slightly favoring the Sigma F1.4. Now actually the sharpest lens in the center of the frame is uh, Sony's 50 millimeter F1.4 G Master, which definitely hits the highest levels that I think I've probably ever seen on a 50 millimeter lens in the center of the frame. Likewise, in the mid frame, the G Master is a little bit sharper, but in the corners, definitely the Sigma is a little bit better. The point is, is that this lens competes with the very best lenses that I could compare it to, and it comes out looking really, really great. It's at a similar or better level than most of those lenses, you know, with some give and take here and there. 
I found that it sharpened up more, particularly by f1.8. Then by f2.8, you're basically flawless all across the frame, extremely sharp corners. And that remains true through f5.6. F by F8, there is a tiny regression due to diffraction. That diffraction becomes more obvious on a high resolution body at F11, and of course, even more obvious at F16, which is the minimum aperture. When it comes to the bokeh side of things, here's where I was more intrigued to see how Sigma did. Because my experience with Sigma lenses is that they tend to be really, really well corrected. So that means that they do really great in chart tests and sharpness tests. Sometimes the overall rendering from the lens isn't quite as magical. I would say that's true here, though I think that Sigma has done a pretty good job overall. I found that specular highlights were nice and clean. There isn't any kind of concentric circles in them. So that part is fine. I found that there is a little bit more edging than what I would like. Uh, right now, it's, you know, it's late March. It's not a pretty season outside. There's a lot of bare things. And so those bare branches that are harder edges, they're not quite as, as smoothly damped as what I would like. Not quite as good, I think, as the 50 millimeter f1.2 G Master lens. But overall, I found that the bokeh, you know, it, it's, it's nice. It's just not, it's not, I wouldn't call it magical in the way that I felt a, the 50 millimeter F1.2 G Master or even the Canon RF 50 millimeter F1.2. I say I would prefer the bokeh quality from both of those lenses. At the same time, I found that Sigma's colors look good. Images have a nice crisp look to them, nice delineation that stands out. Flare resistance is also an area of, of relative strength. I would say that this lens does quite well, even pointed into the sun. And so that's not something that all large aperture lenses do well. So in conclusion, there is really very, very, very few flaws other than what I would call a subjective observation that you know, the bokeh quality is probably a little bit better on some of the top competing first party lenses. So in conclusion, all of the first party 50 millimeter lenses, they are bigger, they are heavier, in some cases much heavier, and they are all much more expensive. The G Master is actually the cheapest of those F1.2 competitors at about $2,000. You'll find that the, the Nikon is about $2,200 and the Canon $2,300. So when you're getting into that range, you're talking about $600, $800, and $900 respectively, more that you would have to pay relative to the Sigma lens, which obviously is a pretty compelling argument for the Sigma lens. It is hard to argue against the value here when really the lens does everything well and uh, something that's not always the case for Sigma. They've really done a great job of keeping the size and the weight down while still achieving all of the optical high marks. And so I think that this is a really, really strong offering from Sigma. You'll have to make a determination whether or not you know, you are willing to move to a third party lens, but what this lens does do is it gives you, I think, a really nice alternative if you're interested in the idea of an f1.2 aperture versus a lens, say, like the Sony 50mm f1.4 G Master, which is only $100 cheaper, but obviously you're getting an f1.2 versus an f1.4 lens. That creates a whole other interesting set of, of buying considerations, but we are so fortunate to live in a market on Sony E-mount and then also on L-mount where there are just so many great lens options available at this point. This is yet another one. If you want more information, you can either look in the description and check out my written review, look out the image gallery. There are some buying links there, though of course this lens is brand new as of today. And so it'll take a little bit for some of those to populate. Now, if you want an even deeper dive into the performance of the lens, stay tuned right now. We'll do our optical deep dive together. So we'll start off by taking a look at the vignette and distortion. And as I alluded to earlier, you can see that there is really not extreme amounts of either. You can see there's just a little bit of a pincushion distortion, that little bit of a kind of inward bulge that's taking place there. And then obviously towards the corners, a little bit more concentrated vignette. Now, the easiest way to deal with that will be via the correction profile, which will be available, no problem. But for me to give you a manual correction, it allows me to show what's actually going on. In this case, I used a minus four to correct for that. You can see it's not a flawless correction, and that's where a, a correction profile will do a better job. Vignetting is plus 65, and so that's a little over two stops. Again, not bad for an f1.2 lens. And for perspective, you can see that there's much more pincushion distortion on the f1.4 lens, and also even the vignette itself is heavier. 
I had to use a minus eight compared to a minus four and then a plus 84 to correct for the vignette. So significantly more telling me that Sigma's done a good job of managing both of those things on this f1.2 lens. Now, when I looked side by side for my chart testing, frankly, both looked pretty similar when it comes to the amount of longitudinal chromatic aberrations with just a little bit less showing for the f1.2 lens shown here. But in real world shots, which is what matters most to me, I found that the f1.2 lens, it performed better. I just didn't see some of the surprise fringing I saw on the f1.4. So we can see here in this transition, it's quite neutral. There's no outlining around these bokeh highlights. So that's nice and clean. Likewise here, where there's a lot of reflective things on a narrow plane of focus, you can see that once again, there's not any fringing. And so that allows our real world kind of micro contrast to be very strong. This shot in particular stands out because basically I've intentionally used the front of our stove, which has these very shiny chrome knobs. So it is a breeding ground for chromatic aberrations. You can see it's really well controlled here. And so just not an issue really at all. Likewise, with the lateral type of chromatic aberrations, you can see that there are very few of them. And here in the edge of the frame, there's just really nothing to see even before correction. So all of that has positive consequences when it comes to the overall sharpness and contrast. So here, 61 megapixels of resolution, 200% magnification. In the center of the frame, things look really nice and crisp. No problems there. The mid frame is looking good. And as we scroll down here, you can see that it's holding on good even towards the outer part of the rule of thirds. And down into the edges, again, there's lots of detail that's there. Now, quick comparison to a few of the other lenses, I will give the quick caveat that I tested the 50mm f1.2 uh, G Master and then the Sigma 50mm f1.4 on the Sony Alpha 1. So it's 50 megapixels versus 61 megapixels. Nonetheless, if we compare the two side by side, we can see that in the center of the frame, both of them really look excellent. There's not really much give or take there, but I would say that Sigma is possibly just a little bit stronger. In the mid frame, I would say that the G Master is has just a tiny edge, but it is very minuscule. As we scroll down here, we can see that contrast is looking good across both of these. I would say that the G Master is just a little bit better in terms of the contrast and the, the fine detail in this zone right here. And as we get down to the very corner, we can see that the G Master has just the tiniest of edges, but you can see across the frame, both lenses are really close. Comparing to the f1.4 Sigma, we can see that center of the frame, I would favor the f1.2 lens. You can see there's better contrast and just more detail and some of the textures there on the bill. In the mid frame, I, the same is true, though I would say that the f1.4 G Master recovers pretty well there. And so it is probably every bit as good in that zone. Looking down in this area here, I would favor the f1.4 lens and its strength kind of rises as you get towards the edge, where I would say here at the edge, it is very slightly better. But for most of the rule of third zones, I would say that I would take the f1.2 lens, though it's not by much. Then finally, versus the F1.4 G Master. Now, both of these are going to be on the A7R5. You can see in the middle of the frame, the G Master is just off the charts good. You can see this moir pattern that's beginning because there's just so much detail and contrast that is there. Looking at the mid frame, you can see that the F1.4 G Master is it's flawless, basically, in the mid frame. The rule of third zones, it is very, very strong. So in this zone, I'm actually surprised the difference is not all that significant. I would say that the GM is ever so slightly better, but it's not by much. And then as we get towards the corner, here's where the uh, Sigma has a bit of an edge. I would say both the contrast and then the detail. You can see here in this writing, it's just better than what it is in the G Master lens. But to give you real world context on what that looks like here at f1.2, taking a look at Nala's face, you can see that that precision and detail, uh, the contrast, delineating all these little tiny textures, it just does a fabulous job. I mean, that's a lot of line pairs right there that are beautifully rendered. So stopping down to f1.4 really doesn't make much of a difference here. You can see as we pop around that not much of a difference even in the corner. 
but there is more of an improvement from f1.4 to f1.8 and by f1.8 i would say we're getting close to what we saw on the 50 millimeter f1.4 g master in terms of that really brilliant center performance you can see in the mid frame too that now we're getting to excellent levels from f2 to f2.8 there's a little bit more of a bump you're going to mostly see it here in the corners where now the detail is just fabulous from corner to corner f4 and f5.6 obviously continue to look fantastic and that's true anywhere that we look we can pop around and look at different spots in the frame and you'll just see just a consistently strong performance there's a tiny regression at f8 that you probably won't hardly notice due to diffraction but at f11 becomes a little bit more noticeable and then by f16 minimum aperture even though this is still good compared to what this lens is capable of diffraction has robbed us of some contrast and detail this lens also does well, not just in terms of the amount of magnification, which is very slightly better than average, but it also does a pretty good job up close. And you can see that depth of field, it's not a completely flat plane of focus, but you can see where we have depth of field, very, very nice detail, even at F 1.2. And yes, that will drop a little bit towards the edge, but you can see it still looks quite good. So that means that close focus distance shots are going to have very nice detail. And of course, it allows with that f1.2 aperture, allows backgrounds to be strongly blurred. But you can see there's still good contrast on the narrow depth of field. I thought this shot really stood out to me because I was shooting at a really, really fine, you know, just kind of the edge of this rolled piece of bark. But you can see that detail and contrast is great. Fringing is well controlled. And then the bokeh quality is nice and soft in this shot. Here's another shot that overall I really like the look of. And so again, it's narrow depth of field, but good contrast and detail there. The bokeh is nice, although as noted earlier in my summation, there's a little bit more outlining than what I would like, but it's kind of picking at straws there. It really looks quite good. This shot is a little busier than what I would like, but it's also a really busy background. And, and so maybe I'm expecting too much for that to be beautifully resolved but i mean you can see that the detail is fabulous just a bit more of the hard edges on this admittedly very very complicated scene now this combines for portrait work here i've put a lot of stuff in the foreground to produce a natural framing you can see the foreground looks good and then the amount of detail on the subject is beautiful now going towards this background here as we'll see in just a moment i think that the gm i think best this a bit but overall i mean it's a it's a beautiful portrait result same kind of things here i mean as far as the detail on the subject really really great uh, in this i would like this to be creamier than what it is and again maybe that's expecting too much the lighting this particular day was was fairly harsh and so that doesn't help here's another more full-length shot and the great thing about a 50 millimeter f1.2 is that you can shoot and even at f1.2 you know the all of the subject is in focus but that's about as deep as depth of field is so right after the subject things start to shift to out of focus which allows you to have that kind of cut out effect of your subject now, while this is the exact same spot, it's not the same season, nor is it the same lighting. And so I don't want to read too much into this, but you can see this shot that was taken on the 50 millimeter F1.2 G Master, that it does have just a little bit more pleasing a look in the out of focus areas. They're just a little bit softer, as you can see. And I feel like they've just blurred away a little bit more. Now, again, you need true apples to apples comparison before you draw too many conclusions, but I'm also basing this on my overall feel this shot for example the bokeh is just really really creamy from it and so i, I really love the 50 millimeter f1.2 g master as a portrait lens and i just didn't see any images where i felt like the sigma was quite that lovely Finally, as noted, flare resistance is really strong, particularly at large apertures here at f1.2. That's pretty much flawless. You stop down to f11, way down, you get this tiny bit of a ghosting pattern, but nothing significant. And again, as we pan back and forth, you can see wide open, basically flawless. And then as we stop it down again to f11, there's that little bit of ghosting pattern, but it is so well controlled for a massive aperture lens like this. Overall, obviously, this is a great image quality performance from top to bottom. So you are one of the diehards that is stuck to the very end. You're one of my favorites. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.